Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. I mean, the kind of hospitality that you showed and Rawan as well, uh, I can see why people are proud to work here. So it's a real delight to be here and to share with you the next kind of half an hour, 45 minutes, uh, and hopefully then have a conversation afterwards um, about some of these themes. So I'd like to take you on a journey, a journey from my own uh, troubled teenagerhood uh, to what we identified as one of the most uh, effective ways to live a kind of successful, meaningful and joyful uh, life within organizations uh, and beyond. This is, a, well, I mean, this is a recent photo, but uh, around 20-ish uh, years ago, uh, I grew up in, in Heidelberg, uh, which is a very romantic, I know some of you, uh, we've had conversations about it, it's one of these cities, very romantic, uh, perfect to retire when you're 60 and older, um, a bit sleepy when you're young, and so I kind of tried to push a lot of boundaries when I was younger, um, and one of these uh, probably was that I, uh, I still think I held the unofficial world record of how many dustbins you can knock off on your way to school, um, and I essentially, you know, had a relatively reckless lifestyle, living into the day, um, and transferred this into my driving style. And then one day, I wasn't so lucky anymore. Uh, I crashed into four parked cars uh, at 80 kilometers per hour, um, and I will never forget the policeman who came to the car when I was kind of um, squeezed into it and said, oh wow, he's still alive. And so this idea that supposedly I should have been dead, and that actually, um, you know, I read a lot about it and, and I thought a lot about it. And what resonated a lot with me is, is this idea that death can be life's greatest motivator. Because when you're facing deaths, the, the days after that accident, I didn't think about anything that I had thought about before, right? Like, how can I enjoy this one day or, or something like that? But I thought about very trivial things like, okay, if I would have died, who would have come to my funeral? Who would have actually cared? Was it all worth it? Did I do anything purposeful here? And I realized, oh my God, like I didn't really use a lot of my time so far to do anything like that mattered. And so that kind of put me on this um, you know, journey towards meaning and trying to figure out like what does it mean to live a purposeful life? Um, and I'll come back to that later on. But one of the things that I found fascinating is as a work, first as an entrepreneur, then community builder, and uh, on the innovation side, but then also in my research is that in a way, implicitly, a lot of our organizations are still based on this very old kind of Maslow hierarchy. Who of you came across this? Uh, hands up. Uh, yeah, probably most of you, right? So Maslow obviously decades ago said human beings have some kind of needs. We first want to fulfill um, all these kind of physiological needs, then our safety needs, then emotional needs, belonging and so on, then our esteem needs, and then if we still have time one day, then we solve the problems we really care about. That's when the kind of meaning comes in. But you know what? We'll do that later. So someone like Bill Gates first builds Microsoft, like makes a lot of money, and then builds a foundation and gives it all back. So the idea is we climb the ladder, we first do well, then we do good. Step by step by step, we climb that ladder. So a lot of our graduates and, uh, in the universities I'm teaching would say, I first go for 10 years into a career that I might not enjoy, but then I have enough resources and enough skills so that I can do the things I really care about. So we go step by step by step climbing this ladder. If you have a car accident in the meantime, if you run in front of a car, then maybe you can't really climb that ladder um, and it might be too late. Now, of course, we also have two more fundamental needs, Wi-Fi and, uh, and battery. <laughs> Um, which, uh, which obviously is, is the case. But what I uh, found or what we found in our research is that actually people, um, and that comes beautifully to also what you talked about earlier, the, the kind of purpose journey, that people don't want to do these things after and after anymore, but actually it's more like an, in, an enlightened circle of needs now, where people want to combine money and meaning, they want to combine these things at the same time rather than waiting for it um, for 10 or 20 years. And of course also then it is in our enlightened self-interest to also cater to the circle of needs of others. Because in this knowledge economy, the more we can provide to others, the more, of course, others want to provide back to us. And so um, what I like about the kind of emerging uh, world that I'll talk about uh, in a bit is this idea that it's in our enlightened self-interest to not be too self-interested in a world that is driven by relationships and by the knowledge economy. And so that kind of like for me was an impetus to say, okay, how do we do, like think about organizations that actually are able to do that, to bring that circle of needs into these organizations and that do well and good at the same time. And then also, of course, like, you know, if you look at all the other pressures out there, environmental, societal, climate change, the urgency that we're facing, and then of course, technological change. And when you take all of this together, one of the things that I've been fascinated by over the last kind of 10 years of doing research on these things is, um, the last kind of 10 years were a lot about looking in very different contexts. So everything from sub-Saharan Africa, very low-income contexts, to um, the kind of senior executives of large, large companies. 
And what emerged was that there's particular themes or particular things that are happening that combine um, elements of what they all have in common, those that are most successful and that seem to be most purpose-driven. One of the things I want to focus on today is something uh, that I'll talk about in a second. These are some other themes, just to give you a, a sense. If you're interested, we did a Leaders on Purpose report on this. So Leaders on Purpose is an organization I've also been involved in. Ajay was one of our interviewees in that as well. Um, so that was all about trying to figure out how do you really integrate purpose across organizations. Uh, some of the themes that came out of it were around developing sense of uh, direction. So how do we align our mission and our capabilities with the big societal challenges, sustainable development goals and so on. Uh, that, but then most importantly, how do we link it to an individual's purpose? How do we integrate it into rituals, performance reviews, compensation? I heard that's a big thing at the moment, compensation reviews, all these different things. So how do we develop into the, into the day to day so that actually we're not disconnecting the bigger purpose to the day to day? Um, of course, cultivating a purpose driven culture. I'll talk a bit about this. But then the thing that I was absolutely fascinated by is all these research projects we did around how do you integrate profit and purpose at scale, how do you scale social impact, how do you create meaningful careers within organizations, all these different settings that we've been in, one thing that always unexpectedly popped up was the importance of serendipity. This idea that we plan things out in one way and then something unexpected happens and we're like, oh my God, and then if that, you know, some people turn it into positive outcomes and others don't. And so in a world that is full of uncertainty, that is so fast changing, that was one of the key life skills that we identified, this ability to cultivate serendipity, the ability to both attract positive unexpected things, but also to turn unexpected situations into positive outcomes. And that's what I'm going to talk about uh, in the next uh, uh, couple of minutes, because that is something across these organizations, across these people, People do it intuitively, but there seem to be patterns that allow us to build a science-based framework that shows us how we can cultivate that serendipity in our own lives. Here's a couple of examples. Did anyone come across Sildenafil? No, that's probably a good sign, because this is essentially, uh, so a couple of decades ago, there were a couple of researchers in a laboratory, and they were trying to figure out, they did injections, and they tried to cure angina. And so they did all these injections and they realized in the male participants' trousers that some kind of something went on there. And, you know, usually, of course, if you're a researcher, you would do one of two things, right? A, okay, embarrassing, you ignore it. Or B, oh my God, we have to find a better product that doesn't have that side effect, right? That's usually what you would do is you ignore it or you try to find a better way to, to, to do it so that it works. They did the opposite. They said, you know what, we know that a lot of men have that problem of not having that kind of movement, so why don't we try to figure out what that is? And that is how Viagra came about. Right? Viagra now being one of the most successful products of all times was completely serendipitous in the sense there was something unexpected happening and they saw it and then they connected the dots, they did something with it. And so that active part we'll talk about in a bit. This is DSM, I don't know who of you, did anyone come across the company DSM? It's a huge kind of um, Dutch company. And uh, what they do is something called the project funeral. So whenever a project doesn't work out, uh, or in, in some of their divisions, they essentially ask the project manager, okay, I talk about what didn't work and what we can learn from it. And so one of these uh, settings, what happened was they had this technology for a window, like a, a coding technology, so that the light wouldn't reflect when, when the light comes through the window. And, you know, they were super excited about it because, you know, light doesn't reflect anymore. But then they were saying, look, like we underestimated that nobody would pay a couple of hundred bucks for like just something that doesn't, you know, reflect the light. And so they were like, look, we will put this to rest. We will give it a funeral and that's it. And then someone in the audience was like, hey, have you thought about what this could mean for solar? Because actually the technology itself seems to absorb so much energy that that could be an amazing technology in the solar context. And that is how their solar division emerged. And so the fascinating thing here is that, again, that was serendipity. It was something unexpected that that happened, but they laid the ground for it and they allowed people to connect the dots. Um, it also has a lot of other effects, right? That kind of ritual in terms of people building more trust because they feel they don't have to hide these things. In most companies, obviously, you try to hide things that don't work out. And so we never learn 
right? But the, the thing obviously is we learn much more from, from failure than from success because that's actually, you know, where the real lessons are. And as I talk about later, success stories usually are anyways partly made up, right? We say we went from this to this, but yeah, it probably went a bit more like this. Uh, we'll talk about this more, but the point is like practices like this project funeral allowed them to have serendipity happening by design without knowing what the outcome could be, but knowing that they provide that environment that would have some kind of possibility for some kind of dots to be connected to something. Can anyone guess what this thing here is? Washing machine, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's exactly, so it's a washing machine, but for potatoes. So, so it's a potato washing machine. And so this is, um, the, the largest company, the largest white goods company in the world, Hire. So they, they bought a General Electric Appliances unit and is now one of the biggest companies in the world that, as a Chinese company, bought part of an American company and tries to, you know, show what could be business model innovation and business model leadership. And one of the things they do is uh, they have a system where they invest into things that are coming up, new ideas that are coming up. And this is one of these ideas that completely serendipitously happened where Hire essentially was selling washing machines. And then they got a lot of calls from farmers who said, my washing machine broke down. And they realized the farmers were washing their potatoes all the time in the regular washing machine because that just felt like the fastest way to do it. But then, of course, the washing machine can't absorb all the dirt, right? And so Hire said, you know what? Instead of just telling the farmers to not wash the potatoes in there, why don't we say we just put like a couple of potatoes on, we, we do a, put a bit of better filter in so that it can filter the dirt and then we make it a potato washing machine for farmers. And so this is kind of like how they actually institutionalized different types of things like this that always serendipitously emerged, but because salespeople were open enough to say, oh wow, there's something surprising here and that's not a bad thing. That can actually be a great thing to happen. This one here is, do you remember when this uh, volcano broke out a couple of years ago in Iceland, in Europe? Uh, so it was this, this volcano with this unpronounceable name, right? Efjakuyako something. Uh, an Icelandic friend of mine said, look, Christian, you're stupid to try to pronounce it. Just say E and then 14. So it's 14 letters. Whatever these 14 letters are, it's just like E14. And so this volcano broke out. And you might remember that uh, there was this huge ash cloud, right? And all these flights were grounded across Europe, especially in London. And so I was in London at that time, and in Oxford at that time, there was the Skoll World Forum, which is the biggest uh, social entrepreneurship forum in the world. And uh, I got a call on a Saturday morning, and Nathaniel, uh, a sandboxer from uh, San Francisco, he called me up, and he was like, look, Christian, uh, we don't know each other. Like, I got your phone number from a mutual friend, but you know what, I just came from the Skoll World Forum, and all these people are stuck in London. They have all their schedules cleared. They have nothing to do. They're all just hanging out here. That was before Netflix, so you couldn't really Netflix and whatever. Like, it was just like, net, like this was like you are in London. And so within 30 hours, Nathaniel produced TEDx Volcano, which was like one of the most successful TEDx conferences of all time. 10,000 people on the recorded live stream, people like Jeff Skoll speaking, and Ted being super excited about it. The point here is that Nathaniel, like a lot of other people, actually saw the, same, saw the same trigger, right? Like a volcano breaking out. That was the same thing for everyone else. But actually what he did was he connected the dots. He said, I know Ted loves stories that are all about like challenge turning into opportunity. And he also had the tenacity to go through with it. And so what he did actually is what I've seen with a lot of people who have serendipity happening all the time. You might see, right, that some people around us, they just seem to be much luckier than others. They just seem to attract much more of this. They seem to have much more serendipity happening to them. And what's fascinating is once you try to understand what are the different things that are happening here, it's not just an event that happened to them. It's actually a whole process. And because it's a process, we can step by step train ourselves into it. So here, like all these four examples essentially had the same process. There was some kind of trigger happening, right? Trigger, for example, being, oh, hey, like this technology didn't work. And then essentially it's around connecting the dots. Like what do I do with this information, myself or someone else? In the case of DSM, someone said, look, in our context, this might actually work. A lot of times we connect the dots ourselves, but also if we give others the opportunity space to connect the dots for us, actually that's how a lot of serendipity happens, and then we need the tenacity to go through with it. And so the fascinating thing is that we see that there is practices that I'll talk about now 
that allow us to have more serendipity individually, but also collectively as an organization, which then leads to, on the individual level, you know, it's joyful, it's meaningful, it allows us to see, oh my God, there's hope that something can happen. But also as an organization, it leads to innovation, it leads to a lot of positive outcomes, particularly also given that a lot of the social problems that we're facing, environmental problems, they're so complex that we can't, like, in advance know a lot of the solutions. A lot of times they emerge serendipitously. And so we need our, to set ourselves up for, for that kind of serendipity. A lot of people do it intuitively, but then they don't tell us about it because it feels like I'm out of control. I'm, I don't have the control here, right? So in this Leaders on Purpose study, for example, that we did, we interviewed 31 CEOs from top companies around the world, uh, including MasterCard. And uh, essentially what was fascinating is that most of them intuitively cultivate serendipity all the time. But actually, then when they go to their board or so, they tell a story as if it was planned because you want to show I was in control. But what's actually fascinating is that a lot of times, once we claim that narrative and say no, it's about creating a culture that allows for this to happen, which is the actual control. Because we cannot control the uncontrollable. If we pretend we can do, that actually is more loss of control than if we say we created a culture that allows us to have that serendipity happen and then actually it allows us to capture that. And I'll come back to this, but one of the biggest things, obviously, that stands in our way is that we all have, or most of us, have some kind of biases. And I briefly want to talk them through, because once we're aware of them, we can overcome some of these things. When, like, I want to do a small experiment. I heard, like, someone told me you're a very forgiving audience. So in case the experiment doesn't work, we just forget about it. Never happened. We delete the video thing, and then, then that's, that's it. Um, so what I'd love to do is briefly go through the room, the first kind of 10, 15 people, and just say your birthday, so the day and the month, not the year, uh, otherwise probably in the US I could get sued or something, I don't know, <laughs> but, uh, but just the day and the month, and if you hear your birthday somewhere, please shout out here, okay? So you say your, you say your birthday, and then you shout here. When we do this now in this room of 60 people, what do you think is the probability that two of you have the same birthday, so you celebrate on the same day? Is it 5%, 10%, 7.7%? What's the probability? I mean, it's 365 days a year, right? Who's good in maths? I mean, I, I had to repeat a year in high school, so I'm not the best person for the maths, but... Uh, <laughs> one in six, right. So one in six, that's between 10 and 20%, right? So what you do is you divide 60 by 360, right? 60 people, 360 days in the, in the year, right? Okay, let's stick with this for a second. Now, let's briefly do this. Just the day and the month, and if you hear your birthday, shout I. December 7th, January 11th, November 24th, October 24th. Right. Okay, I, so one I, yep. October 24th. That's my birthday. Oh, yes. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> yeah. July 6th. Uh -huh. Two, excellent. Yep. January seventh. Mm -hmm. March seventeenth. November eighth. December twentieth. November twenty-third. December twenty-third. Alright, wait. There's another I. So three. Yep. December twenty-third. Yeah. Yep. No. Uh, oh, yeah. May twenty-first. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, I stop here. But so now we have five people already, right? that had the same birthday on the same day, and we said the probability of one of these pairs would be 20%, right? So already now, and if we would go through the room, like it would probably be, usually it's around eight people who have, who have a person who has their same birthday, right? And by the way, please do celebrate your birthdays, right? So yours, a very happy birthday um, for, for you, of course. Um, but so, so, so what I want to show you with this is that we constantly underestimate the unexpected. Um, and that actually, so I, I had a friend in high school um, who always said, very mysteriously, um, he always said, uh, Christian, it's very probable that the improbable happens. And I was like, I have no, like, no idea what you mean with this. But he was this kind of like, he read all these physics books already when he was young, so he was really smart. And, um, and I never understood it until I came across, uh, after and after, this kind of idea that, similar like in this case, we approach the world in a very linear way, right? We think, okay, we have to divide 60 by 360 and so on, because it's just like one out of uh, or, or, or that. But actually, it's exponential. So it's essentially, if you're starting and you tell me your birthday, you have 50 people who could have the same birthday. 
The second person still could have 49 people who have the same birthday. The third person still could have 48 people. So it's to the power of. And so the fascinating thing is that already with 23 people, you have a 50% probability that two people have the same birthday in a room. And then, like, as of 70-something people, it's 99.9% .9 that two people have the same birthday in a room. And so imagine this, right? You don't need 365 people. You only need 70 to have at least one person who has the same birthday. And the reason I find that fascinating is because that is how life unfolds, right? We think we have so much control because we think life happens like in this kind of way that is tech, 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 expected, but actually the unexpected happens all the time. Most of us just don't see it. Or if we don't see it, maybe we want to ignore it. Or if, if, you know, there's a lot of reasons why we don't do it, but essentially it's very improbable that something improbable happens. Um, some of my friends who do a lot of presentations, what they do is uh, they prepare for the unexpected in that way, right? They say, okay, there's a 10% chance that the, this thing will break down. There's a, like 0.5% chance that this building will break down, whatever it is, right? All these things are unexpected, but if you add up all these very unexpected things, something becomes actually quite probable that, that it will happen. And so one of, the key, um, one of the key biases that we have is that we underestimate the unexpected, so a lot of times we miss serendipity because we either don't want to see it or we don't see that kind of trigger. Like in all these examples I showed you, the people might not have seen the trigger if they wouldn't have had an open mind, right? In the case of Viagra, in the case of DSM, and so on. Another one is around self-censoring. So obviously a lot of us have this kind of, um, you know, think about a meeting or something and you have this bright idea, but then a lot of times we self-censor, self right? Because maybe uh, we, I mean, I guess all of us have imposter syndrome, but like to a certain degree we might not speak up or we might not have it. So a lot of times serendipity dies because we might not feel ready for it. We might not feel um, that this is something to be brought up. Functional fixedness, I mean, being in a payments company, um, I, I always, so a lot of my work is in Kenya. And in Kenya, what's fascinating is that, um, you know, when you think about uh, ATM machines in the West, if you're like a, uh, an ATM manufacturer you, and you think about innovation, uh, you think about it in the certain box that you're used to, right? So how do we innovate the ATM? How do we make this ATM better? We think within the solution that we know. Whereas if you're in Kenya and you don't have an ATM in the local village, you think more about how do I get money from A to B? Right? How do I solve the problem without having a solution in mind because we just don't have it? Oh, but we have mobile phones, so maybe there's a way to bring it from A to B. Right? So mobile banking would emerge out of Kenya rather than out of the West. And so this kind of functional fixedness we see in a lot of area that we are used to the hammer, right? And so obviously um, then we kind of, ha it's the whole hammer nail thing, right? If we have a hammer, like every nail um, will, will, will somehow fit us. And so um, it's something that companies like uh, Philips, for example, what they're doing now is they're rethinking their departments because they're saying, look, we don't want to be functionally fixed by how our department is set up. So, for example, one of the departments is or has been uh, tomography. And tomography is a solution in itself. So when you try to innovate within tomography, you're thinking about how to come up with a better tomographic thing versus stepping back and saying, could the department be around the problem we're trying to solve, which is precision analysis. And if we do that, then tomography might be one way but maybe there's 20 other ways. And so a lot of times the way we design teams and the way we design departments already pre-frames the opportunity frame of what we can come up with. And a lot of times we box ourselves into that functional fixedness because we start from a solution idea versus from the problem idea. My favorite though is post-rationalization. Um, you know, when you think about, I mean, you're in HR, right? So you get a lot of CV type um, things. And obviously it's always beautiful, right? How someone eloquently narrates their CV, right? Yeah, then I planned this, then I graded it here, then I planned to go into this, and I planned into this and this. Yeah, okay, well, that's the story you tell us, but then probably it was much more like a wiggle type thing that happened, right? And that's in most projects, right? In most projects, we have some idea that we think about step by step, and then something along the way happens. Maybe we have a great conversation with a coworker who puts us on another track, whatever it is, and so it's a bit more wiggly, but still then in the end, most probably we will tell it again as a control story of step by step, and we planned this, and then this turned out, right? Again, the problem here is we're not really learning from each other because we're not telling the real story, but also more importantly, we essentially neglect the role of serendipity that happens all the time, especially when it comes to the most interesting projects and the most life-changing opportunities. I mean, think about how, I don't know, the most transformative moments in your life, I would assume that a lot of them were not necessarily planned, but they might just have happened, right? Everything from love to um, career to all the big kind of themes in, in life. 
So over the last years, we've mapped a lot of different ideas and a lot of different uh, kind of, uh, you know, coincidental uh, things. And essentially that process kind of like emerged as like a common denominator that there is something that we can control about it um, that goes from that trigger to connecting the dots. And that a lot of times we can miss serendipity at every step, right? We cannot see the trigger. So if we don't see what's different, we miss it. If we don't do something with it, if we don't connect the dots, we miss it. And then if we don't have the tenacity to do something with it, we also might miss it. So there's a couple of things, and for the sake of time, I'll keep that part short, but there's a lot of experiments, those of you who are interested, where people were comparing lucky with unlucky people. Um, and one of my favorites actually is a, um, how are you doing with time, by the way? Are we, how much, uh, yeah, just, yeah. Because uh, they were comparing lucky with unlucky people. And, um, you know, they did this, this experiment where they said, okay, um, they took one very lucky person, so someone who self-identified as extremely lucky, and someone who self-identified as extremely unlucky. And they did the same thing where they said, okay, walk down the street in, in the UK, go into a coffee shop, order a coffee, and sit down. And so what they didn't tell them is that the cameras, like there's hidden cameras across the road, there's a five pound note in front of the coffee shop, and there's only four tables in the coffee shop, three of which there would be actors, and the fourth one is like a super successful businessman who sits right next to the counter. So the lucky person goes down the street, um, sees the five pound note, picks it up, is super excited, yeah, great, I found money, walks into the coffee shop, orders the coffee, has a conversation with the barista, sits next to the businessman, has a conversation, opportunity comes out of it, and like he makes a friend, right? So that's the lucky person's day. The unlucky person like goes down the street, steps over the five pound note, <laughs> goes to the counter, uh, orders the coffee, also sits next to the businessman, because that's the only table that's right next to the counter, ignores the businessman, and that's it. And so at the end of the day, they debrief, right? So they ask the lucky person, how was your day? And the lucky person's, well, amazing, I found money in the street, I made two new friends, and I got an amazing opportunity. And then they ask the, the, the unlucky person, how was your day? Yeah, nothing really happened. And so, and I, f I found that fascinating, because when I look at couples, for example, who are co-founders, some of them would talk about like, oh yeah, the last time I had serendipity was when I met my partner. And then others would be like, yeah, every day five times. And they live the same life. They meet the same people. They have the same business meetings. But they do a couple of things differently um, from each other. And that's what I want to talk about now that we've seen develop both in companies and more broadly in life, what these kind of practices are um, that, that are happening. So one of these practices is around the simple way of how we frame questions. Right? Like, imagine you go to an industry conference and you're like, so what do you do? Right? And then everyone's on autopilot, right? Because we're all in the box then and it's like, yeah, great, I'm working on this and da da da. What about if there's a question that is more around, you know, what's on your mind? What makes you come alive? What is something that is, that is really inspiring you at the moment? Something that allows us to broaden the space, which actually then allows for more dots to be there. It's quite related to um, setting hooks, which I will talk about in a second, which a friend of mine does extremely well. What he does is, when he gets asked, what do you do? He would be like, well, I'm ex extremely excited about this, and then I just started this, and then tomorrow I'll go there, and then this. He uses the same, two sen like the same length of sentences, but he puts four different hooks. So he puts four different things where I can now say, oh my God, such a coincidence that you're excited about this because I just met someone who does this, or such a coincidence, blah, blah. The point here is that he doesn't only give us one potential dot, and like narrates that, but he gives us four or five potential points by saying A, B, C, D, all in one nice kind of small narrative. We talked earlier with Rawan about this, this potentiality of having one or two sentences that describe what, what get, makes us come alive and doing that in a way that actually allows us to give these four or five hooks that allow us to essentially for other people to connect the dots, right? And so there's a lot of these practices in terms of different types of questions we asked, um, how we read between the lines and, and so on. And then, of course, we have um, the whole thing of uh, what we talked about, looking at mistakes or crisis differently. Um, you know, a mistake like Sildena feel, is it really a mistake or is it something that could be great? Um, at Best Buy, so Hubert Julie, who's the chairman of Best Buy, um, he has this fantastic thing around saying, um, you know, this mindset that, that you learn from a monk, that essentially the monk tell, like, they had this conversation around vulnerability. And so this idea that usually when you feel you know, when you feel too much pride or when you feel too, when you have like uh, too much kind of self-confidence, you don't ask for help. 
right? Um, but also what you don't do is you essentially, um, you don't let yourself being helped. And so what happens now is that that actually is a very inhuman way of living life because now if something goes wrong, essentially everyone is a problem, right? Like because you're essentially trying to be perfectionist. Versus if you reframe that and say there is beauty in all of these different things. So for example at Best Buy they had a couple of nice examples where they would, when there's a negative moment happening, they see it as an opportunity to reaffirm their values, right? So they had like uh, a bigger, bigger uh, example was when there was a hurricane in, was it Costa Rica? Uh, Puerto Rico, like, like, no, sorry, yeah, Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico when that hur hurricane was breaking out, uh, or happening, the volcano breaks out, but the volcano, uh, the hurricane happens, when that happens, they essentially, you know, had to close down their shops, and they used that crisis, actually, as a way to say, okay, we always say we're family, so what are the five things now we can do to show we're family? And so essentially what they're doing is, and then obviously, you know, in terms of like employee excitement and everything else afterwards, it was huge because people saw, wow, in the crisis moment, you reaffirmed your values and you used that moment to show us what you really stand for. And obviously crisis moments are the moments where people look up to people to really see what the values are. It's easy to have values in good times, but in those crisis moments, do people really stick by them? So really looking at mistakes and crisis differently. Another one, which is one of my favorites, is reframing situations. Uh, we talked about the Phillips example of reframing away from this is the solution to asking what is the, 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 the actual problem we're solving. But also here, Wakas, he's an entrepreneur uh, now in Canada. And so he got a, uh, who of you is on LinkedIn? Hands up. Yeah. So he got a request on LinkedIn and someone essentially asked him, so Wakas, uh, uh, because he, was, he posted something around, he has a construction business and he was posting something cool about the construction business. And so, um, you know, this, there's this Chinese teenager who reaches out to him and says, this sounds like a fantastic project, can I get involved? And Wakas, he doesn't have, like, resources to hire someone. So what would most people do? They would probably not respond, right? Or say, I'm sorry, I don't have a job for you, right? What Wakas did was he reframed the situation. He said, thank you so much for your message. I don't, like, you know, we don't have anything here yet at the moment, but we want to expand into, because he saw his page, we want to expand into China. If you have any ideas, let me know. This kid reaches back out and says, my, my dad is one of the largest construction developers in China. He would love to work with you. And that's how Wakas got one of his biggest projects, right? When he talks about it now, yeah, it was lucky that he met the son of the construction developer. Yeah, but no one else would have seen it to actually that there's a way to reframe a situation to make that happen. And that's what we see in a lot of contexts, how people, by reframing situations away from what someone tells us to what could be in there, that that's where the real potentiality is, right? Because a lot of times we just try to frame a problem, but a lot of times we don't even know ourselves maybe what it is exactly, or a lot of times actually we might, um, it might help us to reframe that. And so to wrap it up, there's, there's two more. One is we, we talked about placing diverse bets. So companies like Hire and so saying, we want to incentivize when unexpected things happen. And it's not a disproof that our strategy didn't work, but it's a proof that our culture actually is strong enough. But also leveraging technology and space design. Who of you remember, so Pixar, right? Who of you watched like uh, Finding Nemo or something? Like this, yeah? That's it. So, so Pixar, obviously, one of the most creative companies in the world, right? And Pixar had, um, a couple of decades ago when, when Steve Jobs was, was in charge, um, he had architects come to him and ask him, okay, like, we have a suggestion here of, for the new headquarters. And they were like, yeah, we want to build like three different, like, you know, three different buildings, one for management, one for the creatives, one for developers. What did he say? It's a bad idea, right? It's like you separate like people from each other, you separate diversity. So what Jobs said is, I want one big building with a big atrium in the middle, with a key coffee shop in the middle, and then the mailboxes. It was still back in the times where they had mailboxes. The mailbox of the management right next to the mailbox of the development, right next to the mailbox of the creative, so they have to run into each other. There's, like, there's behavior, there's no chance of you not bumping into each other, and then you see, oh, actually, the developer is not as freaky as I thought. Oh, we have more in common, you know, and so on and so on. Because you, you start by having these kind of casual conversations. And so these small, design changes, enabling people to bump into each other constantly by the ways coffee shop and so on is designed. He also tried to only have one uh, bathroom in the middle designed because he wanted everyone to queue up and then have conversations, but the board didn't really <laughs> accept that one. 
Um, and then I talked about setting hooks, and, and there's a beautiful thing around social mobility. Um, for the sake of time, so I'd be delighted to talk about it more um, during our, our Q&A session as well. There's a couple of other things, both tactically we can do, but also as, as organizations. But I want to wrap up, you know, coming out of Germany, uh, uh, or out of Heidelberg, where we have this philosopher's way with the philosophical uh, thought, which is um, wh what I think brings it all together um, with the purpose and the serendipity and, and, and how we b develop companies as like platforms for people to become their best selves. Um, and who of you came across Viktor Frankl? Anyone? So Viktor Frankl is fascinating. You know how some people have a Bible next to their, uh, next to their bed? I have my Viktor Frankl book. Um, and so essentially he... Uh, survived the Holocaust. He was in, in several concentration camps. And he always wondered, he became a psychotherapist, or he was one, and he always wondered, why did I survive psychologically? Because physiologically, of course, you didn't have a choice. Uh, but psychologically, a lot of people gave up hope, but he kept his hope. And so he always wondered, how did I do this? And so he, he talked about two things. One was that he essentially had a duality of meaning and a duality of purpose, where every day he still wanted to talk with one person in the camp, to make the other person feel better about themselves. And by doing that, he felt better about himself. So that was his kind of day-to-day -day enlightened self-interest. But then also, he still wanted to write this book once he would get out of the camps. And so he had this big purpose and this day-to-day -day purpose that somehow kept him going. But also, he had this uh, when he took flying lessons afterwards. And the flight instructor told him, Victor, if you want to fly like this, you have to start like this because the wind will pull you down. So if you start as a realist, you end up as a depressionist. But if you start as an optimist, you end up as the real realist. And actually, that's what Goethe said hundreds of years ago when he said that if you take someone as they are, you make them worse. But if you take someone as who they could be, you make them capable of becoming what they can be. And I've seen that a lot, especially in low-income contexts, but also in more generally. If I look at the former drug addict as a former drug addict, they will stay the former drug addict. But if I look at them as a potential teacher, as a potential whatever could be, that becomes the potentiality for everyone. And I think that is the beauty, I guess, that, that HR also shows, right? That you can work with people on what is their potentiality, who could they be, rather who, who, who they just are at the moment. And, and this kind of potentiality of life as a fig tree, where there could be so many different people and where you can develop that platform for them. And so I hope um, to be, you know, I'm delighted to be part of that conversation, how we can develop companies into platforms for people to become their best selves. And again, without knowing what that can be, but by cultivating an environment that allows us to somehow unexpectedly find it, actually we can hopefully help people do that. With this, thank you so much. Thank you.